Hello, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm excited to tell you about my research, which is a little bit um, off of phages um, in my research in wild plant pathogens. My name is Talia Backman. I'm a PhD student from um, the University of Utah. Maybe. Cool. Okay, so it's well known that bacterial pathogens are a major problem in our crops. They cause annual losses of up to 30% in crop production, which totals in billions of dollars of loss annually. What we know is that oftentimes single genotypes of the bacterial pathogen are responsible for outbreaks in entire um, fields of crops. So if you went to a field at one point in time, you'd see that most of the genetic diversity within the leaves of the plants is a single pathogen taking over. And that if you went back to the same field, even 10 years later, that a new pathogen would rise in dominance. So a big question in research is how can we prevent pathogens from spreading in our crops? My PI um, wanted to look at what are the dynamics like in wild plant populations to see what we could learn from natural systems. So in our lab, we studied the model plant Arabidopsis thaliana and its associated plant pathogen Pseudomonas syringae. Um, this is a really well-established host pathogen system in the literature. And she created this system where she collected um, these pathogens from the leaves of Arabidopsis from six populations in southeastern Germany. And what she found in her research was that um, wild plants have many coexisting pathogens living within the leaves. She also found that we don't often see disease symptoms in these wild plants. So in order to determine whether these um, bacterial strains were pathogenic, she did lab tests of single isolates. Um, what she also found is that over much longer evolutionary time periods, these plant pathogen associations were much more stable. So if you went to a field like 10 years later, like in the agricultural situation, you would see very similar um, pathogenic genotypes as 10 years ago. Throughout my talk, I'll be talking about um, pathogenic versus commensal Pseudomonas syringae. I just wanted to mention that in addition to the pathogens, she found non-disease causing strains, which I will refer to as um, commensals. So one idea for why we might be seeing much more great genetic diversity in wild populations versus our agriculture is that the selective pressures in these wild populations are much um, more complex. For example, we know that in contrast to our agriculture, where we oftentimes have monocrops, so a single genotype of the plant planted across the field, in wild populations, we see much greater plant host genetic diversity. We also know that bacteria encounter a much more diverse array of other microorganisms. And then everyone's favorite um, microorganism here today, we also know that bacteria encounter a diverse array of phages um, within plant leaves. The current understanding in the plant field is that phages exist in the plant. We don't really have very good um, taxonomic um, assignment or characterization to these phages. And what we know is if they're present, the bacterial community shifts. So really there's a large um, potential for research in this field. So we wondered, do the wild Pseudomonas strains that we have in the lab have prophages in their genomes? In our lab, we have over 300 working isolates from these natural populations and have sequenced over 1,500 of these pseudomonas genomes, 1,300 of which were determined to be pathogenic and about 200 were commensal. Okay, so I annotated the viral sequences within the 1,500 pseudomonas genomes and, um, with a vibrant. And so this is looking at any of the viral sequences within the genome. So something like a prophage. This is a lot of data, so I'll break it down for you. Here's a phylogeny of the 1500 strains. Um, each of the rings on the outside of the phylogeny indicates one viral sequence found within that strain. So you can see that all of these guys only had one viral sequence, while all of these had maybe two to three viral sequences. And this guy had eight viral sequences. 
I clustered these viral sequences based on how genetically similar they were to each other and then made these viral clusters. So anything in viral cluster B have pretty similar um, viral sequences compared to the other groups. So we wanted to see if there was any patterns of specificity. Is there a certain prophage or viral-like element um, which are contained in the genomes of the pathogens versus commensals? And what we really quickly began to see is that this viral cluster B was present in every single strain of our um, pathogenic clade. The one that it's missing from was a low quality genome, um, but not in all of the commensal strains. It was only present in a handful of commensal strains and it seems to be pretty divergent. So we're just gonna, I'll leave that note there. So we wanted to investigate what is this highly conserved viral sequence in the pathogen. We found that the viral sequences or this genomic island were integrated between the same flanking genes in the bacterial genome and was highly conserved in its gene content, syntony, um, and size. And then looking closer at one of the viral sequences, they're all made up of these same genes. Um, we found a bunch of prophage tail-like genes. And at this point in time, we were dipping our toes in the phage field and we had no idea what this could be um, because we did not see any capsid, terminase, integrase, or prophage signature genes besides these tail genes. So we wondered, what is this? Is this a pseudogenizing prophage? And then we came across this paper describing something called a phage tail-like bacteriosin or talosin. This is the gene plot from the paper um, with my gene plot on top. And you can see I've underlined the orthologous genes. It's essentially made up of the same um, genetic makeup. So we concluded we probably have this thing called a talosin, which I'd never heard of before. And now it's becoming my PhD project. <laughs> we saw in the literature that you can induce talosins a lot like you can induce phages with mitomycin C. So, I induced the talosins from a couple of my strains and did transmission electron microscopy and found um, talosins both in their relaxed or elongated forms or contracted and stressed forms. So you can see they kind of look like um, a contractile phage tail um, minus the phage head. So we wondered what the hell is a talosin? <laughs> Um, in the literature, it's um, said that talosins likely evolved from phage or share a common ancestor with phage. Talosins um, look like this in their cartoon form. You can see that it has the same like tube shape and then tail fibers at the end, which are the receptor binding proteins. There are two different types of talosins. Ours seem to be an R-type talosin, which are more related to contractile myoviridae phages than Sifoviridae. Okay, so talosins in nature have been observed to be used for killing competitor bacterial cells. They often kill cells um, very closely related to themselves and are even more specific than phages in their killing abilities and target spectrum. So in this scenario, we have a blue bacteria that's able to produce this blue talosin. When a small subset of the population um, expresses talosins, it actually causes the producer cell to lyse, flinging the talosins into the environment with the hope that they'll come into contact with a target cell that they can kill. So in this scenario, this pink cell, um, the talosins are able to use their receptor binding proteins or tail fibers to bind to the outer membrane of the cell, inject its inner tube um, into the membrane, causing it to depolarize and kill the cell. Something I want to emphasize is that this is a very small portion of the blue bacterial population committing cell suicide so the rest of its population will survive. So it's an altruistic mechanism. And then something I really want to emphasize with this group is that these are not self-replicating um, like phages anymore. They are a protein complex in the bacterial genome. So the bacteria has to produce these. So we started this project wondering if the wild pseudomonas strains encode viral elements or prophages, and we found that all of our wild pseudomonas isolates encode 
this thing called a talisin. So we wondered, because we know that these are often used for competition, which strains the talisins are targeting. As you'll remember, we have um, the pathogens who make the talisins. So we wondered, are the pathogens killing other pathogens? Are they killing the commensals who don't have talisins? Or maybe the other community members um, living within the leaf. So I induced talisins from four different strains, and I did these killing assays on soft agar, um, a lot like the plaque assays that you guys have talked a lot about. Um, a difference between talisin killing and phage killing is that these are just essentially um, proteins in solution. And so as you go to higher dilutions, you see that it just goes from um, stronger killing to more, a more opaque zone of killing. And it won't extend past the um, pipetted area. So I did this assay. Um, here I'm showing the tester strain, so the um, bacteria on the plate, whether they're pathogenic or commensal, and then whether they're resistant or sensitive to four different talisins. Um, each column indicates a different talisin. What we really quickly began to see is that most of the killing was done by pathogens um, towards other pathogens, with only a handful of commensals being killed and none of the other community members being killed, suggesting these talisins are being used by pathogens against other pathogens. So, what this means is there must be many talisins in this population, or in other words, there must be many different versions of the talisin that are able to kill um, different pathogens. So we wondered um, how many talisin variants are in the population and how are talisins targeting different bacterial strains. Much like some phage, talisins use their tail fibers to bind to the lipopolysaccharide. In my case, um, these talisins only target gram-negative bacteria, and they oftentimes will bind to the O antigen, so the outermost polysaccharide chain. So we hypothesized that there must be a few different tail fiber variants within the population. To test this, we did a bioinformatic approach where we wanted to see if there are any talisin genes evolving more quickly in the, um, within the cluster than the others, and we would expect that the tail fibers would be, or would have more genetic variation. So I calculated the nucleotide diversity for all of the genes across the entire genome. Anything to the left of the plot would ind indicate that every gene in the population has the exact same nucleotide sequence. Anything toward the right shows genes in the population with a very different nucleotide sequence across um, different strains. What we found is that 24 of the 26 talisin genes had a nucleotide diversity of less than 0.05, which was the genome-wide average suggesting they're evolving at about the same rate as the rest of the bacterial genome. Um, really excitingly, we found that the tail fiber assembly gene and tail fiber gene had a nucleotide diversity of greater than 0.15, which was significantly greater than the rest of the talosin genes and um, the genome-wide average. So this suggests that we have um, tail fiber variation within this population. And so we hypothesized that this tail fiber variation could predict killing or is responsible for different killing spectrum of different pathogens. I started to look at nucleotide and amino acid sequences for these tail fibers or receptor binding proteins, and I wasn't able to find any broad scale patterns until a very helpful reviewer asked us if there was a conserved tail fiber gene link, so the nucleotide base pairs of the tail fiber gene. And what we found is this striking um, pattern that there are only four main tail fiber gene links conserved in the population. You can see that about 75% of strains make up the top two um, variants. So we wondered, do these tail fiber gene link variants correlate with killing spectrum? So again, I did my killing assays. Um, but I took talisins with very, the four different link variants. And essentially what I found is that tail fiber gene link explains killing. So we found 
that each of the strains were not able to kill themselves, which was expected for talisans. That this 1383 base pair variant could kill these two variants, couldn't kill the 1830. The 1830 kills everyone but itself. Um, and I'm still working on filling in the other blanks for this system. So in my work, I found that all of the pathogens in the system encode a talisin. This is a really um, exciting finding because a lot of what we know about talisins are like, let me take a sewer sample and see what's there. Um, this is the first time that anyone's found a population wide scale of talisin dynamics and how this competition is occurring in these wild populations and how these populations are evolving because of the talisin. Um, selective pressure. We found that these pathogens are essentially in this molecular warfare to kill other pathogens. So they're probably trying to outcompete their closely um, related bacterial strains for space in the plant leaf. And that there are four talisin variants within the population. A lot like phage, um, phages, where we want to use them for phage therapy. Now we're thinking about using these talisins for talisin therapy. So in my plants or my lab's context, we like to think about plants. Um, so in this study, they took bacterial plants, grew them normally. They added a bacterial pathogen. You can see that the plants are very sad. Um, and then they added a bacterial pathogen with a talisin known to kill that pathogen. And you can see that disease symptoms are reduced by over 80%. But this is not to say that talisins can't be used in a mouse model or human context. There are um, like four or five examples in the literature using talisins for um, pathogens within mice and chicks. What's really cool about them, which um, we heard about yesterday, is that you can swap the tail fibers for phage tail fibers um, and really target their killing spectrum. Um, the advantages to using talisins over phages <laughs> is that these are not self-replicating um, organisms. They are proteins. So you can apply them to a human or a plant, and um, they're not going to keep replicating. Um, in the future of my work, I've identified it, a few of the O antigen receptors for these talosins. And I would like to determine if evolving resistance to talosins has a trade-off for plant host colonization, because we know that the O antigen in gram-negative strains often shields um, the bacteria from host innate immunity. We also know that it helps aid in adhesion and virulence to the bacterial strain. And so if the bacteria were to become resistant to a talosin, we know that they have to mutate their O antigen, which would probably um, have a really great trade-off in their plant. With that, I would like to thank my lab, um, my funding, and then all of you for listening. <laughs>